If you have your Bibles with you this afternoon, I don't know why you'd come to a Bible conference without your Bibles. But if you don't have yours with you, there'll be a Baptist seated near you there. Reach over and take his Bible and find the pages that are stuck together. That's called the Book of Acts. All right, keep your seats. I'm just having a little fun here. I want to speak to you this afternoon on power, not power. Power, not power. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen by them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now you might just underline it in passing, kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from, the, from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? There it is again. Look at the word kingdom. Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now let's pray. Just place your hands on your Bible there and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we've not gathered here to hear the opinions of men. We long for a word from you, all of us. God, I know that there's no way that I can preach this message in my own flesh and that it will avail anything. I yield myself to you as fully as I know how to do. And I'm asking you, God, that you would speak through me somehow. Overcome every predilection, every prejudicial barrier, every hindrance to the gospel, and commune deep within, in the inner chamber of every heart. I'm not asking you that when we leave here, that anyone will remember the sermon topic or the preacher. But I humbly beseech you, God, in the name of Jesus, that when we leave here, every one of us will say to ourselves, Surely this day I have heard from God. I believe you for that in advance. In Jesus' name, the strong Son of God. Amen. I believe that sometimes it's easy for us to look back on the apostles and the disciples that were closest to Jesus and to take almost an arrogant and judgmental attitude toward them. Now, be honest, isn't, isn't it true that from time to time it creeps into our minds to want to say, what was the matter with these blokes? Couldn't they see what was going on? I mean... Couldn't they see the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the healings, the deliverance? Couldn't they look on his face, hear his voice, talk to him and get it? I mean, what was the problem here? You just read the stories of the, of the, the Gospels and even in the early chapters of the book of Acts and you just want to say to Peter and James and John and the others, what's the matter with you? Answer the phone. You just feel like you... you you, you want to be... I say it to my own self about my own life. I could be a better Christian. I know that I would be a better Christian if I could live like that, if I could walk with Jesus, if I could hold His hand and see Him cast out demons and, and make, spittle from clay, uh, uh, make clay from spittle and put it on the eyes of a, of a blind man and wash it off in the pool of Siloam. I, I would walk like a saint of God 24 hours a day if I could be in that atmosphere. But the problem is, you see, really, that if we project ourselves back into this event, 
this most magnificent of all historical events, the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, these were not people who had somehow or another prepared themselves for this event. They were not particularly clever. These were hard-working, blue-collar workers, professional fishermen with calluses on their hands and calluses on their brains. They weren't particularly spiritual giants. These were just common, ordinary people onto the stage of whose lives exploded the Messiah of the ages. And they spent the next three years asking themselves one question. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? In the pursuit of the answer to that question, there is no group of people ever to have lived anywhere whose emotions and whose intellect and whose spirits endured a more horrifying itineration than the apostles. Up and down, mountain peak and valley, huge variations in experience and and emotional uh, uh, blessing and then a sense of almost devastation. I mean, imagine this. Imagine walking into a graveyard with a guy to visit the grave of a man who has been four days dead. And, and I, I love the prissy language of the King James Version, don't you? Martha says, by now he stinketh. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> By now he stinketh. And the Lord says, roll away the stone. Breathless anticipation in the cemetery. He raises his hand and says, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man walks alive. I mean, imagine... The unthinkable gradually intrudes on your thoughts. Is he? Could he be? Is it possible that this is the seed of the woman in my generation? No matter how you say that you believe Messiah will come, no matter how you believe that, that there's coming the seed of the woman to bruise the serpent's head, one may not, after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of reading and studying the prophets, actually believe that he will walk into your front yard or get in your boat. It may be even harder to believe if he looks just like you and sounds just like you. Jesus didn't have a halo. You understand this, don't you? You see these artistic renderings of the holy family of Mary and Joseph and the baby going up to the inn with halos on their heads? They didn't have halos. I can prove it to you. If they had a halo, they would have put them in the inn. Somebody comes up to your door with a halo on, you just put some sucker out of his room. <laughs> I'm sorry, mate, but this guy's got a halo. He stays. <laughs> no, there was nothing about them that... Even, even Jesus wasn't handsome. Even, even Jesus wasn't handsome. The Bible is perfectly clear on this. Even he wasn't attractive. There's nothing about him that just gave it away. You didn't walk into the room and fall to your knees and say, Messiah. That makes it harder, you see. You get to struggle through this while you're watching it take place before your eyes. And so one night, around a campfire in the open mouth of a cave at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked the question that you've been trying to elude. Whom do men say that I am? They offer all kinds of stumbling explanations. Some say Elijah, Isaiah, a prophet raised from the dead, John the Baptist. Nervous laughter filters around the campfire and finally Jesus says, yes, well, that's all fine. Whom do you say that I am? Everybody stares at his sandal feet until Simon Peter speaks. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And there it is. It's out. What you'd been afraid to even think, Peter speaks. And you watch, will Jesus reach across the glowing embers and slap him in the mouth? The ancient Jewish symbol for heresy. Jesus himself was slapped later on, as was Paul the Apostle. For just the same answer to the same question. Instead, Jesus says, you're right. You're right. 
You've had a faith revelation from God. That's who I am. All right, there. There it is. Now your mind and your thoughts and your emotions just, just catapult into action. What does the first century Jew to believe to be true about the coming of Messiah? Well, he's going to come like a Moshe Diane standing up in the turret of a Sherman tank. A first century conquering hero who's going to turn his guns on the Antonia fortress and blast the mean old Romans out of the water. Maybe he's going to nail Pilate to the walls of Jerusalem as Pilate uh, crucified 600. Maybe he's going to mingle Pilate's blood with the blood of profane sacrifices made to false Roman gods. They see a conquering hero, a champion riding astride a, a white stallion. Even, even the Palm Sunday event itself seems to reinforce this. As Jesus comes, the people tear the branches off of the palm trees and wave them in the air. Remember, the first sign of Jew the first symbol of uh, Jewish Zionism was not a star of David. It was a palm branch. The people are waving the palm branch, the symbol of the coming of the Messianic kingdom, the restoration of Davidic rule. And they're shouting what? Hosanna. Hosanna. Modern Americans use Hosanna to mean hallelujah. It doesn't mean hallelujah. It means save us now. Save us now. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. The apostles say, this is it. This is it. He's going to establish the kingdom. He's the new David. As if to reinforce this, Jesus goes straight through the gate beautiful, right into the temple, and drives the money changers out. Wouldn't you like to have been just a fly on the wall to watch that? I mean, think of that. Have you ever asked yourself this? Why didn't they just... There were a lot of them and only one of him. He wasn't packing a rod. I mean, why didn't they just bind his arms and pitch him down the steps of the temple? As he charged in amongst the tables, turning tables over, coins flying everywhere, preachers diving out every window. Why didn't they just grab him and tie his hands and feet and tumble him down the steps of the temple. Because something down inside of them, perhaps even at a visceral level, something said, mm, don't mess with this dude. See, he acts like he owns the place. And what did he say? This is my father's house. The ears of the apostles, their antennas are, are absolutely a tingle. This is kingdom language. This is kingdom language. It's about to happen. So what does he do then? Retreats through a lonely garden where he's arrested, taken before a kangaroo, a kangaroo court, crucified, dead, buried, a stone rolled over the tomb and entombed with him all their hopes and dreams of messianic glory. What had they hoped for? So don't be too highfalutin and too theological on this. If he's going to have a big throne... If he's going to have the throne of David, they don't want the throne of David. They know they can't have the throne of David. That's reserved for Jesus. They want Jesus to have the big throne, but there's going to be six thrones on either side of it, little thrones. They don't want the big throne, but they want those little thrones. In fact, we know this because James and John come with their mother. They want the thrones on either side of it. Let us have these thrones. We don't want to just be even among the 12 thrones. We don't want to be off on either end. Mm. We want to be right next to the big throne. And the other apostles are just furious over it. Why? Because of their impertinence and arrogance? No, because they beat them to the punch. <laughs> and people are waving these palm branches and throwing their garments before the donkey and shouting, Hosanna to the king. They say, well, we're not the king, but we're the king's buddies. We're not the king, but we're leading the donkey. We're not the king, he's the king, but I am the king's bodyguard. We're the king's friends. We've been traveling around with him for three years up in the boondocks. We've come to Jerusalem. We're with the king, you see. Now all of a sudden the king is dead. The king is dead and it's dangerous. Now they say, we don't know him. King who? <laughs> see, now it's dangerous to be with the king. So they're lonely, fearful, frustrated. Their dreams of messianic glory, their thrones are robbed from them. Peter said, I'm going fishing. 
All kinds of people go fishing when they're backslidden. <laughs> See, if I can't have a throne, if I can't have a kingdom, I don't want anything. I'm going back up to Galilee and go fishing. This, is, this thing's come to nothing. This has come to nothing. Up, he's the Messiah. Down, he's dead. Three days later, some hysterical women say, we've seen him, he's alive. Well, you want to believe that. You'd like to believe that, but you know, women, you know. <laughs> also, if he was going to appear alive, if he was raised from the dead, he's not going to appear to an ex-hooker in a cemetery. <laughs> He'll appear passing through the veil in the temple appearing in the full vesture of the high priest and announce his messianic kingdom. If he's alive, he's not going to show himself to Mary Magdalene of all people. Alone in a cemetery? No, no, no. You meet together, you talk about it, you share, you try to figure it out. Finally, Thomas says what you've been thinking. He says, I can't do this anymore. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. He's... He says, I can't handle this anymore. He said, there's got to be some tangible kingdom stuff here or I can't handle it. I'm going to put my hands in the nail scars of his, of his hands and thrust my hand into the wound of his side. And I'm, What's he saying? He's saying, I don't believe it at all. He's not doing a bargain with God. He's stating a rhetorical denial of the resurrection. Just as they're discussing it. <laughs> Jesus walks through the wall. <laughs> You know, I've often thought, it would be a fascinating thing if on any given Tuesday morning, at 10 o'clock in the morning, if Jesus walked through the wall of every seminary classroom in America. <laughs> About 90% of what they've been teaching for 40 years go right down the tubes. <laughs> so all the discussion's over. There's Jesus. He's alive. And raised up with him, they begin to think kingdom thoughts. And he spends the next 40 days teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So they say, now we've got it. Isn't this just like Jesus? What a joker. What a, what a joker, they say. That guy, that guy right in the town on the cult of an ass. And let them kill him. Isn't that funny? They say, you know, this guy, he, we always thought he was a little eccentric, but isn't this? And this is the kingdom. All this other stuff, this death and burial stuff, this was a joke. Now comes the kingdom. He's even talking about it. He's teaching about it. So finally, he begins teaching them about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they say, Lord, we think we figured it out. Is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Get these stinking Gentiles out of our city and put up the throne of David and... <laughs> is this it? Is, is the, thy kingdom come, Lord. We've never prayed it with such excitement before. This is it, isn't it? Is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, No! No! Don't you know there were times when Jesus must have looked up to heaven and said, are you sure these are the ones? <laughs> I mean, don't you know there are times right now when Jesus must visit his churches and say, Father, are you sure? He says, no. No, no, no. Not a kingdom. A kingdom. <laughs> Not power. You're, you're talking about power. Not power. Power. <laughs> Throughout his ministry, Jesus had this magnificent way of speaking words at two levels. In fact, even at a multiplicity of levels at the same time. He spoke and they addressed the intellect of a man. 
They elicited the proper response, and then even as the man was doing what he was told to do, you, could, you can read the pages of Scripture. It's just filled with people who do what Jesus says and then do a double take. Luke chapter 5, Jesus says to Simon Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Peter starts rowing the boat. and Suddenly he says, I don't think this is what you're talking about. Words that just are impregnated with heaven, filled with eternity, and suddenly seek, seep down, percolate down through the intellect and down into the spirit of man. The, the whole Bible is filled with this. We, we get so hung up, we, we hear the words at this, at this cozy, tidy little intellectual level and hammer our theology to the main mast of things that were not even meant to be taken at that level. Take, for example, things like... Like... Uh, hold on to your hats here. Like going up to heaven. Up to heaven. Now, I don't want anybody to leave and say, the speaker today didn't believe in heaven. I believe in heaven. But in what sense is heaven up? I mean, you see, don't you, if heaven is up, geographically from Dallas, then it's straight down from Sydney, Australia. You see what I mean? That means if you die in Sydney, you've got to circle the globe, you see, before you can go up. So heaven is not up geographically, it's up dimensionally. It's above us, it's beyond us, it's... it's up. <laughs> the same thing is true of hell. We, we want hell. Listen, if we would get our minds into the Spirit and the Spirit into our minds, we wouldn't make some of the goofy mistakes we make in the charismatic movement. And listen, anytime you hear some cockamamie story about some drilling team in Lithuania that opens a mine shaft and hears screaming, what in the world? Hell's not down from Lithuania. You could sink a drill bit in Commerce Street and drill right straight through the earth. And you're going to puncture, you're not going to come out in hell, you're going to come out in Bombay. <laughs> Having spent some considerable time in Bombay, let me say that the distinction is only subtle. <laughs> but it'll be Bombay nonetheless. But C.S. Lewis says that hell is the is the shrinking away, it is the diminution of everything that is godly and good and holy and righteous. It is, the, it is the, the shrinking of the spirit of man. So he says that every soul that has ever died or ever will die and, and gone to hell, ever ever died and gone to hell or ever will die and go to hell, could fit into a crack in the sidewalk. So hell is not down, it's It's down. John the Revelator struggled with this in the book of Revelation. He knew that he had seen things that defied human vocabulary. Whether in Greek or Hebrew or Latin or English or any other thing, he was trying to squeeze eternity into words. Instead, we take the words and just open entire denominations over them. The, the words that, that he didn't... Oh! If he had said to us... If we had said to him, Oh! Streets paved with gold. Oh, John, we, we can't wait. Do you mean there's going to be gold, cobblestones, gold right out of the hills of California? Oh, this is going to be so wonderful, gold. He would say, oh, thou fool, not gold. Gold. <laughs> well, you can, you can hear the same frustration here in the words of the Master. He says... What are you talking kingdom? You're talking about a kingdom. You're talking about swords and armies and thrones and palaces and, and walled cities and, and capitulation ceremonies and drum and bugle corps. I'm not talking about a kingdom. I'm talking about a kingdom. You're talking about power. You're talking about the strength of your right arm. You're talking about the wisdom to conduct military strategy. You're talking about drawing a sword with your arm. You're talking about throwing a javelin. You're talking about the force and the weight of a chariot at Pell-Mell Run. I'm talking about power. Not power, power. 
We must get it through our heads that every attempt in the church or in the world to squeeze the character and essence of the kingdom into a contemporaneity which it will not endure will do damage to us and damage in our generation. This is the very basic question of liberation theology. I was in a seminary in Lima, Peru some years ago and uh, I saw a wall poster. There's a picture of a, of a sister, of a nun, you see a Roman Catholic nun, in full um, dress, habit. She had a bandolera of bullets across her chest and a, a 44 magnum on her hip and hand grenades hanging off like this and a Uzi machine gun cocked up on her hip like that. And underneath it says um, something in English, it would be like a new theology for a new world. You see, that's not a new theology. That says, if God isn't going to get on with this kingdom thing, I'm going to do it myself. If he won't give me a throne, I'm going to take one. If he won't make me a palace, I'm going to seize one. So we just take over the radio station and announce that the kingdom has come. The problem is, the kingdom is riddled with worms before dawn. The problem is it's not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of me. It's the kingdom of my own strength. It's the kingdom of force of arms. It's the kingdom that stinks in the nostrils of the kingdom. It's about power, but not power. I see it in churches. So, so sad to watch people who are talking about the kingdom of God who are operating with each other horizontally in the power of the kingdom of this world. Divisions in churches that are little more than petty backroom squabbling, smoke-filled chambers with pot-bellied politicians jockeying for position. And, and, and it's always been that way. Listen, do you understand that the people who resist the move of the Spirit in their generation the most are always the people with the most ecclesiastical turf to protect? Those who resist the move of the Holy Spirit, it's almost never, you can mark this one down, listen to this. Historically speaking, and biblically speaking, when anybody slams their door on the Holy Spirit and says, not that way, not here, not now, it will almost never really genuinely be a theological issue. They may say it is. It's actually going to be a, a, an argument over who's in charge here. See, Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God and he was not crucified by prostitutes and barkeeps. They received him gladly. It was the religious leaders of his day that said, this threatens our kingdom. Jesus said, this is my father's house. And they stood there with their hands in their pockets, but in their heart of hearts they're thinking, oh no, it's not. Oh no, it's not. It may be your father's house in broad daylight, but we'll get you after dark. And they did. I went to preach in revival services in a church in Kansas. The pastor met me at the airplane and he said, uh, he said, actually, you're here a little bit under false pretenses. pretenses. I said, now, what does that mean? He said, well, we're going to have services at night, but he said, my church is absolutely in war. We're having civil war. And he said, my deacons have agreed that if you would sit into a meeting and listen to the situation and see if you can help us, I'm willing to listen, they're willing to listen, I said, no, thank you. No way. I'm not here to adjudicate your problems. I said, just buy me a ticket. I thought I was here to preach in river. Oh, he said, please, please, please. They'll listen, I'll listen. Oh, he said, just, just sit and listen for a few minutes. So I agreed. In an idiocy born of naivete, I actually thought that I might help. I sat in on the meeting, a vitriolic anger. An absolute anger filled the room. I just sat and listened for a long time. And you know how you begin to kind of trace the vectors? And I could see that the lines all seemed to cross on one brother. And so finally I asked him, I said, Sir, I just sense that you can help me here. And you could almost see him go, it looked like somebody pulled a swell button on an organ. He said, he said, well, what did you want to ask? I said, what is the real problem here? What is the problem? 
He said, I'll tell you what the problem here is. He said, the problem here is that this is supposed to be a charismatic church and this pastor won't get out of the way and let the Holy Ghost flow. I'm tired of him putting his foot on the throat of the Holy Spirit. We just want him to get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit flow. And it just came up out of me. I said, no, sir. That is not what you want. What you want is to be the pastor and you haven't paid the dues. He clenched his fist, his face turned red, his eyes bulged out. He said, how dare you come in here and say that to me? I said, sir, you pled with me to come in here and say that to you. I said, now take it for whatever you want, but the issue here is spiritual authority and rebellion. The pastor took me back to the airport, head bowed. Finally, he said, oh, he said, Dr. Rutland, he said, I... I love you and I appreciate you, but he said, I think you missed it in there today. I said, probably I did. He said, that man is my closest friend. He's at my right hand. I said, friend, David said in the book of Psalms, Oh, Lord, it's not my enemy, but him that eateth at my right hand. I said, sir, you've got a snake in the basket, and you need to either get him out or go home and pack your bags. He called me two months later. When I answered the phone in my office, he was weeping. He said, Dr. Rutland, I, I can't believe this. He said, I can't believe what's happened. He said, they had a private secret meeting of the deacons last night. And they, they've sacked me. They fired me. They put me out of my church. He said, I bought the land. I bought the land on which the building sits, $50,000 of my own money. I bought the land. He said, they fired me. I'm out. I said, I only have one question. Did they appoint an interim pastor? He said, yes, you know, that's the funniest thing of all. He said, they appointed that guy you spoke to in the beacons meeting that night. You see, the issue is here, power. It's about power. I've seen little tiny people who would rather be the captain on a sinking ship than to swab the deck in a mighty armada. They're perfectly happy for the whole ship to go right down. And arguing, bickering over the, uh, I mean, a hole in the hole the size of a, of, you could drive a truck through it, and they're arguing over where to put the deck chairs. They just want the, they just want the authority. Sam Jones came to Georgia preaching holiness, and the preachers preached against Sam Jones. Billy Sunday came to Chicago and tried to close down the bars and the prostit houses of prostitution, and the preachers tried to close down Billy Sunday. Over and over and over again, it's as if we can't learn it. Every time the power of the kingdom begins to erupt through into broad daylight, the power of the kingdoms of this world rises up with vitriolic anger. Power against power, kingdom against kingdom. It's even more subtle than that, brethren. Now listen to this. Even at the very heart of the matter, the way we do ministry, the way we worship, the closer we get to the genuine power, the most dangerous moment is when we have begun to experience the power of a resurrected Christ and we sense the kingdom is very close. Pray with a thousand people. The power of God breaks forth and the anointing of the Lord flows and mighty things happen. But instead of fastening in on the God of miracles, we fasten in on the miracles of God. Now the next time that comes, you put in an advert that those things are going to happen and bad, George, they better happen. They've got to happen. They've got to happen meeting after meeting after meeting, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And then what happens on the Sunday when there's no miracle? Then you take the power into your own hand. Then it's not your kingdom anymore. And the problem is we've lost the ability to discern what's precious from what's garbage. Listen, you, you, I'm, I'm not saying that people being falling out in the Spirit, for example. Take that. Falling in the Spirit, that's just an example. Call it whatever you want. Some people call it slain in the Spirit. That's just a little bit militant for me. Sounds like the Holy Ghost is armed, you know. But, but uh, whatever it is, slain in the Spirit, resting in the Spirit, falling out in the Spirit... That's a genuine historical reality in revival circles. But the problem is, if I get to where I've got to have that, that's the evidentiary proof of my ministry, then when it doesn't happen, I have to manipulate it. 
So you tell the organist to turn the volume up to the point where all the insects in the air are dying. <laughs> and you just rev the thing. You just rev a bunch of emotional Pentecostals until they're in a, a fever pitch. Then you call people forward and a kind of a tragic kind of mass hysteria oh, begins to operate at a very, very dangerous corporate level. And you call people forward, tell them to bend their head back at a 45 degree angle and stiff arm them at the hairline. I can slay the biggest man in this place in the spirit. <laughs> but it's about power. It's not power, it's power. That's not the kingdom of God. It's the strength of my right arm. It's the talent of the orchestra. It's, the, it's something, but it's not God. But we, we've got to have it. We want that throne. We want that proof. So we begin to play these horrible, monstrous religious games, feeding and gorging ourselves on the things that are, that are not really power. I've seen it in families. Ruptured, broken over issues that are as, as simple and as basic as this. Like 22 years of marriage counseling. 22 years of marriage counseling I've been doing. And it's just amazing. Any of you ever, uh, any of you ever have the horrifying experience of making a long car journey with your children? Will you raise your hand? <laughs> you know you start the journey out with the precious little darlings in the back seat. You love them, you would kill for them. And you know, by the time you reach to about Phoenix, you're ready to sell them to the gypsies. <laughs> and what the issues back there are never, the, what are they, idiotic. She's got her foot on my side. <laughs> She's got her foot on my side. And you start out with all kinds of reasonable, rational things, you know, now. We'll just make an imaginary line here and you keep your foot... Then after, you know, after about two states, you said, you put your foot on her side again, I'm going to break it off and beat both of you with it. <laughs> and then you see, you see, you realize you're not even a Christian. You're not even saved. You, your children stare up at you like you're the Phantom of the Opera or something, you see. And you realize that there's some power loose in the car. There's some kingdom happening here. And it's not anything you want. Well, after 22 years of marriage counseling, you bring perfectly intelligent, urbane, sophisticated Americans into a counseling. We've been married 40 years. And they're just at each other's throats. And you say, well, can you tell me what the issue seems to be here? I say, yes, she's got her foot on my side. I began 22 years ago wanting to do all of this sophisticated counseling. Now I just call them in and slap them. <laughs> you just want to say, you just want to say to wives, don't you understand? Don't you understand? This is not about law. She said, I'm tired of submitting. I'm tired of submitting. I said, sister, you never have submitted. <laughs> Ever once. You're not getting it. Submitting is not subjection. Submitting, women who have attended every seminar on marriage from here to Kalamazoo, who are filled with anger and rebellion, and say to themselves, I'm, I submit, I submit to the dog every day. <laughs> I do everything, oh, the lousy, lost, drunk, oh, I'm going to submit though. I submit if it kills me. And you just want to say, this is about power. This is your and all hand to hand, no holes barred combat for who's going to drive. And then you just want to say to the husband, you, you great big bully. You bully. Sometimes I think that evangelical husbands have bought a miserable bill of goods. I am the head of the household. <laughs> L listen, guys, listen. It's King Jesus, not King Kong. <laughs> so here's this lost, doomed, drunken, wretched, selfish pig 
who goes off to a full gospel businessman's meeting and he gets saved, gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and some nincompoop hands him Ephesians 5 and 22 is the first verse in the whole Bible he ever sees. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. He says, thank God. That's what I've been wanting. So he comes home and stamps it in his wife's forehead. So she's in a house trailer. You can put your fist through the wall. The power company's turning the lights off. There's no water to it. The children have got diphtheria. But on the opening day of deer season, color that boy, gone. He's in the woods. She says, I don't think you ought to go deer hunting. He says, why submit yourselves unto your husbands? But he forgot 21. Submitting yourselves unto each other in the fear of the Lord. You want power? Listen, brother. I wish there wasn't a woman in the place. I wish I could just speak to every man here. You want power? You want power in your home? You want a kingdom? Wash your wife's feet. Jesus said, you want to be the greatest? You want to be the big cheese in your house? Put a towel around your waist and wash the flaming dishes. That's in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus said, you want to be the big boss? He said, I'll tell you how to be the big boss. Get up on this cross with me and hang here till you die. How did Jesus become the head of the church? How did he establish his kingdom? Climb up onto the throne and shout, I am the new David. Kneel before me. No, that's going to come. That's going to come. But not the last time. Pilate said, don't you understand? I have the power to crucify you. That's the only time Jesus answered him. He said, there you're wrong. You have no power over me except the power that has been suffered you to have. This is my kingdom. Pilate said, are you a king? He said, I, I am. You're a kingdom. Your kingdom is a miserable remnant of the decaying Caesars. My kingdom is the transcendent glory of an eternal God. Your kingdom is on the outside. My kingdom is on the inside. Your followers fight. My followers are willing to die. Your followers will die. Mine will live. Yours think they win and they're going to lose. Mine will lose and find out that they won. He said, this is power. He said, you want to learn power, Pilate? Torture me, beat me, crucify me, hammer me to wood, throw me into a grave, roll across a stone. I still love you. I will not react to your weakness. I will respond to the power of God. Power, not power. Power in the church, not manipulation. Power in the church, not religious games. Power in preaching. Power in ministry. Pastor, preacher, teacher, minister of the Word. In all of your great techniques that you've learned, in all of the wonderful church growth things. Listen, I've got a Ph.D. in church growth that isn't worth the paper it's printed on. And all of your learning and all of your understandings, all of your concepts, have you learned the power of the kingdom? Well, let me close with this. Listen to this. Maybe I should have said this and forgotten all the rest. I was in a small healing conference in West Georgia a few years ago. They'd asked me to come and teach on healing. And uh, I had suffered for several years with coming and going with a, of a planter's wart in my left heel. Does anybody know what a planter's wart is? This is the wart from hell. This is... It is... 
uh, excruciatingly painful, unbelievably. Well, it would come and go and that kind of thing, but on the second morning of this little healing conference, the planter's ward in my left heel swelled up like a golf ball and turned purple. I couldn't even put my shoe on. Excruciating, painful, worse than that, embarrassing. I was there to teach on healing. Couldn't even get to the platform. I had to go. Oh, it was awful. My song leader and I were there in the, the little shabby hotel room where we were staying, praying. He anointed me with oil, and we claimed Bible verses, and we did everything, every tape I'd ever heard told me to do. Oh, we were just speaking it and claiming it and confessing it. And And the problem was, nothing helped. Nothing. It got worse. Every time I prayed, it got worse. Finally, we went down to the church there, and it was about an hour before the service, and there was a lady that was in the little fellowship hall there cooking supper, and so my co-worker went to tune his guitar with the piano, and I laid down in the pews in the front row there, just propped my foot up, I just said, oh, God, isn't there anything you can do? I said, God, isn't it? You know, there, I mean a real prayer. I just said, oh, God, I, I don't understand this. You're supposed to be a God of power. And here I lie. God, I don't think I can even do this conference. The lady working in the kitchen, the very illiterate elderly lady, and her son had Down syndrome. You understand what I mean? What we commonly call a mongoloid. It's a young man, about 28, I guess. He had the mentality of about a six-year-old, I guess. Cowboy hat on, had a big star. It said sheriff. Pistols, pearl handle revolvers. He was running around in the sanctuary. Big old man, 28 years old. This jump up from behind the pews and said, bang, 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 bang. And I was trying to be nice. My foot's killing me here. So I said, you know, bang, bang, go back in the kitchen with your mother there, you know. I said, now go on, go on back in the kitchen. Dr. Rutland's lying here praying to die, and I need you to go out. And And you know, all of a sudden, I had the most bizarre impulse from God, I think. Everybody else in the whole kingdom seems to hear from God so plainly. You know, I get these garbled notes. So, boys, this man's name was Jimmy. And the note I got says, why don't you ask Jimmy to pray for your foot? I said, uh, wait a minute here, Lord. Uh, I have a master's degree from Emory University, the Harvard of the South. I have an earned Ph.D. I should pray for Jimmy to be healed of this Down syndrome. I'm not going to get Jimmy's... Got Pearl handle revolvers here. God, I'm not, I'm not going to get Jimmy to pray for my foot. It seemed like the Holy Spirit said, okay, it's your foot. <laughs> so I just said, I said, come here, Jimmy. I said, I said, when you hurt yourself, does your mommy ever pray for you? He said, yes. I said, I've hurt my foot. And I, I badly, I need Jesus to heal me. I said, would you pray for me? And I, I'm not mocking the boy at all. Please don't take any offense for this. I want you to understand what happened, though, okay? He just pulled his cowboy hat off and dropped down on his little knees there by the edge of that pew. He reached over and put his hands on my foot, and he said, Jesus, heal, brother, my foot. 
Jesus' name, amen. Put his cowboy hat on and said, bang, bang. I just looked up to him. I said, great. <laughs> you know, one of those moments where you want to say, yeah, that kingdom come, right. <laughs> God is my witness. I mean, he's hearing me talk to you right now. In a half an hour, the pain was completely gone. In an hour, the coloration had gone. And in two hours, the planter's wart completely disappeared. And in ten years, it has never, ever come again. <laughs> never come again! So, what's the conclusion? So, what's the conclusion? We're going to buy a van and... Put him on the road to Jimmy Johnson, Pearl Handle, Holy Ghost Miracle Crusade. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to all get in our cars and traipse off to middle Georgia and see if we can find this boy with Down syndrome to pray for us. No. We don't have to enshrine it. We don't have to organize it or incorporate it or choose officers. Jesus said, this is not about a kingdom. This is a kingdom. This is not about power. This is power. Thy kingdom come. I, I don't know where you are in your life right now, but I, I ask you this simple question. Have you found the joy of submitting to the kingdom and the delightsome day-to-day unmitigated, undiluted thrill of the power of God. Well, let's just bow our heads and pray. All over the auditorium, if you will, please. Almighty God, righteous, omnipotent, everlasting, holy King, Thy kingdom come in me. Lord, I'm sick of power. Lord, I'm sick of the structures and systems on which I've leaned. I'm sick of the power of my own talents or abilities. I'm, I'm sick of the power. I've feasted on it and drunk it and been inebriated with it drunken. Oh, God, have mercy on me. Lord, I want to divorce myself from power. God, all these stupid, petty little kingdoms that I've ruled with such energy, I resign. Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, Oh, that I might know your power. And Jesus said, and you, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. Power. In the name of Jesus, friend, receive thou the Holy Spirit. Now just ask Him right where you are. In your own way, just ask Him. Say, oh God, fill me. Fill me now. Grant me Thy power. I'm tired of power. I want power. Wives, husbands, rebellious teenagers, pastors, you've been defending your theological position and missing the kingdom boat. Just say, oh God, grant me your power. Now receive in the name of Jesus. Be filled with the fullness of God, afresh, anew, for the first time. 
Now just lift up your hands and praise His name. Let me just uh, do what I think in our hearts all of us are doing. I just, and you can look this way if you want to. I, I, uh, I feel so privileged to be able to sit here and hear what we just heard. I feel like sometimes the Lord just sort of comes and clothes himself in his gifts to the church, a pastor. And just really speaks to us. I know a little bit about preaching. I've heard great preaching. I'm going to tell you something. What I just heard make me feel like I've never preached in my life. I don't want to know how to preach. I want to know how to preach. But I'm just so grateful. Can you believe a few minutes before we came out here, Mark got me to sit out and said, you need to help me. You need to kind of help me know what I need to do and how to do it. God help us. <laughs> I helped him. <laughs> well, I had enough sense to know. We don't, you, you just, just what's in your heart. I believe we got what was in God's heart. Boy, we got a double dose. And can you see the blend from where we came this morning to where we are now. Do you remember how I was moved with the Spirit to get up and explain so that you not misunderstand what Dennis was saying? And I just in a little summary, succinct way said, now this is not what he's talking about. And he's over there nodding. That's not what I'm talking about. And then we get up and hear this tonight. This is what he's talking about this afternoon. This is it. This is power. This, this is what will change nations. Not political or church organizations. A living spiritual organism. The body of Christ giving Him glory. Father, I want to thank You. I want to thank You for Mark's availability to You. Thank You for the supernatural gift to bring the Word of God before us and it live. It live. He did not speak letter. He spoke life. But it was true to the letter. Father, he did not destroy, he redeemed, he edified us, he encouraged us, he stimulated our hearts to good works. We have not been manipulated or intimidated. We have been stirred in our souls by power, your power. And we want to thank you for Mark, and we just pray a special blessing on him and his family and his congregation. Would you raise up there in Orlando a light that cannot in any way be hidden? Would you use him, Father, there? Would you raise up people there after your own heart and then overflow your life out toward others all over the world? I thank you for this sacred moment, Jesus. I thank you for it. I believe the rest of the afternoon is going to be so special because we're not only going to be talking about power, we're going to be seeing firsthand what power, your power, your presence is doing, your person in us is doing. And we thank you so much for it. In Jesus' name, we're going, to, we're going to stand and sing briefly. Our daughter Rhonda is going to come and sing in just a few moments, and then Jack Deere is coming to speak. And I just really feel like the Lord is just carrying us somewhere that's very special this afternoon. Let's stand together.